supervisor is also not here, I guess. Oh, she's here. Ah. Right behind you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad she is. I thought I'm just here. I work with her. Oh, yeah, she is here. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Right. No, I'm looking for him. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, then um, we do it like this. You have probably some questions, and I hope the audience has also some questions, and maybe the opponent appears before we finish. You start. So it begins. Hi, I'm Abhilash, and uh, for the last few months, I've dedicated my life in, uh, in passing judgments on the works of those who are more qualified than me. And today, I'm going to demonstrate that to you precisely. My topic is the evaluation of the relevance of agile maturity models in industry practice, and, uh, and I conducted a case study for that. And I'm just going to follow the template of uh, the thesis, and I'm going to follow that order. So to begin with, the issue. Uh, over the years, a lot of teams in the industry and, and the organization themselves have, have uh, shifted uh, to the agile way of working. And one of the primary reasons is that agile actually addressed those needs of the organizations that, uh, when compared to the traditional models such as waterfall. Uh, for example, uh, in the organization's upfront, pla uh, upfront planning is, is difficult. You don't know uh, for sure what will be the situation in a year. So an agile actually discourages you to have an upfront planning. It says plan as short as possible. And for example, requirements, you can't be sure of all the requirements at a time at the beginning. So Agile actually gives you a way to adopt the changes and requirements and everything. And, and that's uh, the reason why the organizations tend to move towards it. However, that's not the entire story. Uh, if you compare uh, the textbook version of Agile and the ones that are being implemented in the industry, you will find some dis differences there. Why? Because the organizations and the teams have certain context-specific needs, uh, which the textbook versions do not address. Uh, for example, agile methods like Scrum, Kanban, XP, Scrum is the most popular. Uh, teams do not uh, implement them uh, exactly as they're described. For example, I can give, uh, since I conducted a case study, I'll give you the example of my team itself. Uh, they are supposed to be Scrum, but uh, they are an operations team. So they get interrupted almost every day with customer reports. Now, one distinguishing characteristic of Scrum is that it should not be interrupted. No disruptive uh, uh, interruptions allowed during the sprint. All of them have to wait uh, till the sprint is over. But this team cannot afford that. So, in fact, they prioritize uh, these unplanned work uh, over the ones that were planned. So they allow those things to come in. So that kind of modification to Scrum, and these methods are practiced uh, implemented through Agile practices. And the teams customize them, they add them, they borrow from other methods, and they try all of those things. Uh, so these are the differences. Now, imagine a team that is actually beginning or considering transitioning to Agile. Now they have a list of practices, let's say example 15 practices. This team is confronted by a choice. Either they have to implement all of them at once, which is called a Big Bang implementation, or they could do an incremental form, which means a set of practices at a time, and then a few more, and then a few more, until all of them are fulfilled. Uh, in the research, it was found that the teams generally prefer uh, to take the latter option. They do not choose this one, probably because even they don't know the set of practices they would like to implement on day one. And it was also found that this leads to poor quality work. So obviously, this seems like the best option, isn't it? So is it that the unicorn option? Unfortunately not. Uh, why? Because the, these 15 practices, as an example we consider, they can't be implemented randomly. Uh, you can't just arbitrarily pick a 5 and then a 10, because there is no, these practices are not independent. They have dependencies between them. And Ken Beck, the creator of XP, suggested that some practices reinforce each other uh, to make each other better. Now, this is the state of Agile right now. So a new approach in, in the last decade came, which is called Agile Maturity Models. Uh, so these people have their own set of practices that they would like us to implement. And they say, uh, uh, they give you a set of practices, and they say in these many increments, either three or a five or a seven, and they say in each increment which practices to implement at first. So that's also a problem, right? Unfortunately, again, no. Because these agile machine models are multifarious. There are several in the literature, 
and all of them are distinct from each other, which means the order of practices that they suggest are distinct from each other, so we don't know which one is right. Obviously, some needs to be right and some needs to be wrong, but how do we know? They haven't been evaluated uh, as much as we would like it to be. So we need them, uh, we need them to be evaluated in the industry, which is what the goal of my study is, is to evaluate the relevance of agile maturity models in industry practice. So how did I accomplish this goal? I began with uh, finding the agile maturity models in the literature. I find them, and then I find the dependencies between those models, uh, in, in those models between practices. And then I go uh, to an industry and find a team and conduct a case study and then see what dependencies they experience and what are the dynamics present in that team. And then I bring those dynamics and dependencies that are present in the team and then I compare with the agile maturity model to see if these address the dependencies and such dynamics present in the team. So that would lead me to my goal. So how do I begin? Well, uh, there was a research that said that there, there are about 62 agile practices. Well, I can't hold all of them together. Obviously, I need a starting point. And so I began by choosing 18 agile practices. Uh, these are generally the most popular agile practices, and I, this is my starting point. For example, face-to-face. -face. What does that mean? It means the team is co-located. They're not sitting in cubicles. They're not sitting in their own offices. Uh, they are sitting together. Self-organizing teams, which means that the teams take the local decision. They don't wait for the bureaucrats or the top management to make the choices for them. And that way, we have about 18 practices. Now, my first task was to find the Agile maturity models. How do I do it? Fortunately, there exists a systematic literature review, a recent one already. So I didn't have to conduct it myself. So I obtained the relevant uh, maturity models that were for my uh, study. And, and I'll look for uh, maturity models if there are more in the search engine. In terms of case study, like I previously mentioned, it's an operations team in a multinational telecommunications company. I'm not supposed to give you the name. And the size of the team is 10 members. And I interviewed six of them. And these were semi-structured interviews. So how did I do that? I went to the organization. And before I conducted interviews, I gave them a sheet, uh, Agile Practices Timeline Sheet. So this was before the interview. And if you look at it, it consists of all the 18 practices that I consider for this study. And then I gave the definitions for them because the definitions of the terms are also not fixed in, in today's literature. So we need to make sure the terms are univocal. And then if they used it or not used it or they don't know, and then they mark in which year they actually implemented and for how long it has been going. So, whoa. What's that? Oh, yeah. So it would look something like that. They would take and they would draw a line. I don't know what happened. And then during the interview, I, for each of these 17 questions, I asked this core set of questions. Uh, for each of these practices, I asked, how is it being implemented? Because we need to know how they are actually implementing it. And then I, know, uh, I asked them how it has changed over the time, because it doesn't have to be implemented the same way for years. And what are the positives and negatives, the advantages and disadvantages? And then once I establish the terms and what's going on, I ask them for dependencies, if there are dependencies between these practices. And throughout the interviews, I have asked for dependencies. So what did I end up with? I got eight agile maturity models. And uh, from, my, from my case study, I found they used 18 practices. And these 18 practices had 19 dependencies. So here's the thing, uh, regarding maturity models to be more clear, uh, these are two of the eight maturity models that I found. Now, uh, the practices that I represent, oh, I feel like a teacher, uh, the practices that are represented here are not an exhaustive list because I only consider practices that are practiced by the team because I need something to compare with. The practices that I are not practiced by the team, I have nothing to compare with. So I only take the practices that are practiced by the team. Uh, one thing that happened was I couldn't derive the individual dependencies, so I couldn't come up with something like CI has a dependency with uh, short iterations and frequent releases, but nonetheless I found it in maturity level. For example, these practices need to be implemented before these are implemented. And for my case study, the interview, these were the six members 
uh, wonderful guys. Uh, they were very kind and very elaborate. Their designations, uh, the thing is they don't, even though they have the de designation, they could do whatever they want. So it's kind of they designate themselves. Uh, but nonetheless, it's something like this. And two of them have been in the team from the beginning of that team. So remember the uh, timeline sheet that I showed you? Uh, from that, I could deduce, uh, or rather induce, this, this uh, timeline. They began with coding standards and then continuous integration. And then in 2010, I don't know if you can see, uh, the agile practices were in. And that's how it went. And with the, in, in regards to dependencies, uh, I found that these people used 18 practices. Now, I considered 18, but 17 of them matched with uh, their practices, but one did. Simple design, which the definition is the goal is to uh, design the simplest solution. They don't explicitly practice that, so there's no way I could know what procedure or anything like that. But nonetheless, I found the dependencies in regards to simple design. They use another practice called uh, definition of done. Uh, which I didn't consider and I had to add. And between these practices, I could uh, induce these dependencies. And these are 19. So, the analysis. Now that I have the practices, well, here's the thing. Uh, like I said, there are several agile practices. Now, the fact that the team is implementing a few of them is an indication that they found some value in them. If they didn't find any value or if it was bad for them, they wouldn't be doing it. So obviously there is some value in each of the practices that they implement and they have been implementing. Now this premise is strengthened by the advantages and disadvantages they mentioned for that practice. And based on that, I was able to classify them as significant practices and insignificant practices. Now significant means that they have some noteworthy effect or they have some importance in the team. Insignificant doesn't mean they mean nothing. It just means they're not significant. So. I had some statements from them saying, uh, for example, continuous integration. The team stated that this was perhaps the most important uh, practice. Without this, the rest wouldn't work. So that is absolutely critical. And for example, stand-up meetings. Since the team sits so close together, they're always talking to each other. So they know what their peers are up to. So they decided that they don't need a stand-up every single day, so they decided to have it uh, twice a week. But nonetheless, it's not insignificant. They do have some things to gain from it, but it's not critical. And in regards to dependencies, I classify the dependencies into two, again. So the dependencies that are critical, uh, I decided they were, were called red dependencies, and the ones that were low dependencies, where, uh, where it's not negligible, but it's not critical as well. So it, it deserves a mention. So to begin, uh, for example, uh, take a look at the first one, continuous integration and short iterations and frequent releases. He stated that for them to release the product frequently, they need continuous integration. And without continuous integration, they'll have to do the manual testing and the product will almost never work. So continuous integration is absolutely necessary for short iterations, frequent releases. The same way goes, if you can see, these are green dependencies. So let's say stand up and refactoring. So when they're doing stand-ups, the interviewees noted one significant thing is that uh, they talk about what they have done and what they're doing, and then if they have any problems. Well, when people have problems, they tend to come up with refactoring problems, and someone volunteers, and they sit together, and they refactor the code. And there was another statement saying that when people sit together and refactor, it's a lot better when compared to sitting alone. So stand-up reinforces refactoring, but now it's not indispensable. So therefore, it's a green dependency. Now, using these things, how did I evaluate? Uh, well, I classified in three ways. Relevant, mostly relevant, and not relevant maturity models. So a maturity model is considered relevant when all of the significant and insignificant practices uh, considered by the team are suggested by the model, and all the dependencies, the red and the green, which are not so important dependencies, if, if they are all suggested by the model, it's completely relevant to the team. What about mostly relevant? Well, all the critical practices are suggested, may or may not suggest not so critical practices, and the same, the critical dependencies are suggested, but may or may not suggest all the critical dependency. And not relevant, if, if they don't suggest critical practices, for example, continuous integration, like I said. Imagine a model that does not suggest continuous integration. Would that be relevant to the team? Of course not. So it doesn't matter if they feel that, uh, the dependencies wouldn't matter. So. Let me give you an example of uh, evaluating one of my maturity models. 
I took maturity model four in my thesis, which is the sunny, and this is the table, and now we're doing practice evaluation. And these are significant and these are insignificant. Now, if you compare if the presence of these practices here, you will notice, let's take an example of definition of done, which is a significant practice, but it's not mentioned here. The team stated that uh, previously, I mean, uh, implementing a function or a story is kind of like writing thesis. Uh, it's kind of like writing thesis. It's never done. You always have something to improve. So sometimes people get lost in it, and hours and hours are gone. So the team thought, let's have a definition of done. Say, OK, this is done, and then it should be a new task if you want. And that has tremendously helped them. And they say it is a significant importance. So that is definition of done. And for example, metaphors. Uh, metaphors is an insignificant practice, which means a high level the requirement in a, in a sense that people would understand what the system is. And that is not present here. So this model does not address all the significant and all the insignificant, only some of them. So what does that mean? It gets placed here. Oops. Now, it doesn't matter what dependencies are, but let's do it for uh, an example, right? So the dependency evaluation, we have these uh, maturity model, and then uh, consider this continuous integration and short iterations and frequent releases. So short iteration, frequent releases needs continuous integration to be present for it to work. So let's see. Continuous integration is level three, and short iteration is in level four. So the dependency is satisfied. Let's take another example of pointer. Continuous integration and coding standards. So the team stated that uh, you can have as many rules as you want, but for you to implement them, you need an environment, the CI environment, which makes sure that you implement them. Otherwise, you, you just need someone to stand behind you and check if you're implementing those rules. They stated that. And so I, for coding standards, the continuous integration has a significant uh, influence. But continuous integration is here, and the coding standards is here. So that doesn't satisfy the dependency. Let's take another example. Tracking progress in sprint planning meetings. Sprint planning, so tracking progress needs sprint planning. Uh, these two are in the same level, but you see, for tracking progress, sprint planning is required. So it's in the same level, it's still there. So therefore, it is also considered satisfied. So if you notice, these are only 14, because not all the practices of the team are considered. So the practices that are common to those few practices are checked here. So it satisfies not all red and not all green. That would put it there. So that way, I analyze the relevance of agile maturity models, and I have uh, chosen eight. And seven of them have been uh, evaluated as not relevant. One, one model, it suggested so few practices, and it talked about what is good, what is bad, and then said the practitioners need to make their mind, and they need to choose. Now, I can't speak for the team that I uh, performed study on, so I love to hear it from them. So that cannot be evaluated using this method. Now. Can there ever be a universal uh, relevant agile maturity model? Now, what I checked is for this team. But at the beginning, I said the teams have context-specific needs. Now, by definition, context-specific needs are specific to the context. You can't have universal. It's a contradiction. But somehow, can there be a maturity model in the future that somehow addresses the critical needs and then somehow leads them to the right direction? That only time can tell. But if you can ask me, I would say never say never. Thank you very much. So you still have uh, 30 minutes? Oh, was I too fast? <laughs> so that was a bit too fast, I think. Being an Indian, you can't give on time. Let's go first to the audience. I have some. Yes, but uh, let's see if the students want to speak yes. first, right? Uh, yes, please. It, it runs pretty fast, but uh, oh, this is sorry about that. Yeah. With uh, one group in one company. Yes, uh, yes. A team, yes. Okay. So, I get the hint, okay? Uh, in that sense, what you evaluate there. It's not if it's relevant as a whole, but if it's relevant for that team. Do you agree with me? Yes. So what is the implication of these results for the overall agile community? Well, it's a starting point. Now, you can have two options. You could do some kind of, uh, let's say, survey where 
uh, somehow find out what they're doing. But for my this research, I needed to know how they were implementing it, and I needed to know the whole context of what they're doing, because the definitions, again, are different, so we need to match them uh, to make sure. For that, I needed to conduct a case study. Now, for now, this is a starting point. So there is a choice. Either I could go for a survey and rely on a rough data or have a case study, and at least the first step is clear. So I chose to do the case study. Uh, at least this is a starting point, and as the time goes, we can all have the uh, test with the next one. And I, I would really like to see uh, the evaluation with other teams and see how they are, because I can, I, I had, this is an operations team, and uh, they pointed out two differences that they have with their neighbor development teams, and one is test-driven development. They value so much, but these guys, it's an insignificant practice, but uh, th that's the case. And the sprints get interrupted so much, uh, the development teams don't, so that practice is also a little changed. So we need to see, but this is a great starting point, I feel. Do you think it is possible to apply the same method to other teams and get, uh, I would not say similar, but comparable results? Yes, yes. In fact, uh, this is an agile team, uh, sorry, uh, scrum kind of team, but there were some XP maturity models that I found, but... I could not evaluate them because this is an agile team. Mm -hmm. So you could just have this input. Find a team, have those practices, those four questions, get the results, put that through that uh, evaluation model I said, and you get the result. Uh, uh, so in a way, I think I came up with a model, but I would, uh, I would say that this is uh, less specific, and I actually have a lot of ideas to make it more specific, but I haven't implemented it yet, and I haven't put that in the draft. So. Mm -hmm. So I didn't present that here, but I do have it to make more specific. I have two more, and uh, one is regarding your presentation. Hmm. The dependencies for me seems very interesting, but it seems that you can model a little bit more. As you told about the model, you can actually represent that as a graph or some other kind of uh, uh, structure that is easy to see. Because what you have there is a bunch of uh, attributes Arrow marks. and the connections. I, you know what, I, I must tell you that. I actually had a diagram in my mm -hmm. thesis, but I want to remove it because it doesn't make sense. Uh, so I was actually trying to come up with uh, something like this uh, to map out all the dependencies together and somehow come up with this. But this table is not possible. Why? Because if SPM can be somewhere here, then the practice that it depends on should also have to be adjusted. So there is no way I could place each practice in somewhere. But I could make this diagram. Mm -hmm. uh, for now, there is one diagram which I don't like it, so I want to change it. But that's true. I, I, I agree with you. But I think even that kind of diagram can present you a, a very nice structure on how complex is that definition of relevance for that team. Yes. Because if it has so much connections, it means that it's very complex for the team itself. Yes, yes. Okay. And finally, it, I would like you to discuss a little bit about the saturation of the data, because you have a team with 10 uh, participants, right? Uh, six interviews, 10, uh, ten exactly. members. Exactly, yes. and you did the interview with six of them. Yes, yes. And at some point, I think, the, the results start to repeat, it turns out. So, uh, I understand. You... Yes, uh, by the time I reached my sixth interview, I was hearing the same things again and again, but new things were being mentioned. Uh, but I was out of uh, the people who were actually experienced in that team. So I was left with people who were a year or, or uh, graduates like me. Uh, or not, I'm not graduated yet, but people, young folks like me. Uh, so, so from this team, I could milk the cow this much. But I really would have liked to go and have more interviews. Because it was fun. I... Similarities? Did you find strong dependencies? So that group that you 
Well, I did find some significant dependencies, and I found something. Uh, I, I, can you rephrase that even? If you don't mind, I'm sorry. Can I point to a slide? No, no, no. Oh, okay. Just generally, the work was done. Uh, it was a very good work and uh, um, very uh, detailed and careful done. So, but unfortunately, since there were only six uh, uh, employees and the group is so tight, it, those results cannot be generalized. Yes, it can't be generalized. But if uh, the company will come back and ask you, what can you tell us about this small group? What were your findings? Say, like summarizing to the team or the maturity models? About this specific team, what maturity models? What the hmm. There was one maturity model that was almost there, mm -hmm. but it didn't satisfy a significant practice. And it and one insignificant practice, I think. Uh, but it was almost there. Uh, so 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 I would say that I mean I, I've I mean, I understand what you mean, but for that, I need to see how other teams work because I'm not used to this industry. So for me, only that team is industry for me. So I'm unable to compare or think about something. Yeah. But do you think that we have uh, something um, very obvious if you find some dependencies from the nice uh, um, dependencies that you have there? Did you believe that from your team? It was strong dependencies with some of them. You said only one. Similarity. Only one of the maturity models. The group that we had. Yes. The dependencies, the strong or the light dependencies, you said it was only similar with one. It, it, it was from one group. Uh, yeah. With yeah. One maturity. Yes. Uh, no, one group. One group with one maturity. They were very close, hmm? but not there yet. Yes. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I felt bad for it. That was like, but but you tend to get biased in such cases. You need to hold back and. Uh, I don't that. think that it's terrible feeling bad. It's really no, it's just. I mean, I wanted to show at least there is one, and it, it, to say that none of them work, and <laughs> it feels bad. <laughs> but objective. Yes. I'm actually glad that uh, you liked it, and yeah. <laughs> so you had at the beginning, you had uh, you said that you chose eighteen agile, agile practices. Yes. Why did you choose these eighteen? These are the most uh, frequent ones, the common ones, oh, and based uh, on which authority? Uh, well, uh, recent uh, SLR that I that was conducted, they chose uh, those eighteen. So I just picked those eighteen. They chose eighteen, but based on what grounds? Uh, based on. Uh, Scrum and XP is generally popular, so the generally more popular practices are these 18. And and I also checked the sources, uh, and I read through the papers, but but to what they've said, and I have to take them by the word, it's, they are the most frequently used practices. Mm -hmm. And that actually proves them right, because the practices which I picked, out of 18, 17 of them hit home. So that's an indication that these are indeed uh, generally used practices. Were there any practices that you encountered in the companies which were not uh, yes, uh, definition of done practice. Okay. Mm -hmm. And um, I think you also said you did the mapping between the practices which were found in literature, the ones you selected, the 18 ones, and uh, the practices you found in industry because they were not named in the same way, or they were different. Uh, you had one slide, I think, if you know, at the beginning. Beginning. The, the so this is the eighteen practices AMMs case study oh got core questions that's the method the results. results literature WAs timeline. No, okay, then maybe it's interesting. Okay. Because that does, these are all case study practices, right? Yeah. Okay. You mean the dependencies in the literature? No. Um, okay. I was wondering if in the literature the names of the practices were the same as the, the 
yeah names in the case study yeah uh, so so that was one task and in these maturity models they tend to describe the characteristics mm -hmm. of these and there were some maturity model that gave you the whole file giving the definitions mm -hmm. so i did my best to match them uh, but that that was a task yeah. again the terms need to be univocal and i made yeah. sure okay um so you didn't talk anything about validity aspects of your study. I hope it's in the thesis. Oh yeah, it is in the thesis. Oh. Is it? Oh, it is in the. I I wrote one page and I mean there are many things. For example, uh, well I'm not uh, to be to be quite honest with you I'm not thorough with uh, the, these names but I, I have done some work and mentioned them. One is uh, this is a qualitative study and not a quantitative study. So there might be a little bias in, in this. I did my job to so be not what, biased. What, so you know there are different um, categories of validity threats? Yeah, internal, construct, and external. And these external is generalization. And because it's a case study and I need to know the context, this is a starting point. And internal, uh, oh, what is happening? So you I can. You have to look it up, you should know now. <laughs> no, I mean you can tell uh, the names. I'm uh, I'm not sure, but you can tell me what th that is about. No, you and can I'll tell me what you what you think of which threats you encountered in your thesis. And both you can think about the study design. Can I tell you one thing? When I was taking uh, talking about the dependencies, I when uh, for each dependency, I wrote justification why they are dependent. And when I was doing that, I ha I could turn the story either way to my wish. And, and that is an indication that I'm being biased. So for that, I, I probably went three refinements. And even after I submitted draft, there was one practice, dependency that I dropped. So I've gone through the transcripts over and over again. And, and I gave a few days of break and then saw it with fresh mind. I did everything and these things keep getting refining. But my ultimate goal is to be as objective as I can. So that's clear in general validity, right? Yeah. Um, do you somehow describe that in your thesis, that um, when you describe how you decided which dependencies exist, that these kind of interpretations may go in one direction or another? Yeah, direction? because now that I understood the team... Uh, but you need to describe that in your thesis. Yeah, I did. Okay, good. Uh, I mean, now that I have a picture of the team, I could come up with some dependencies. But I made sure that they have stated that there is a dependency. And only the and not only stating they gave some code that I could use to justify so the it's dependence. Not only your interpretation, but their yeah, absolutely. They need to say it, and not just saying it. They need to make sure, uh, give a sensible, uh, mm -hmm. you know, justification for it. Because I found two dependencies. They just stated it, and they didn't justify. So one, one recommendation, what I would give you, because you have done this quite in a systematic way, and you have what you sample where you collect the data is rather small, right? So you have you had not much to do in terms of finding the maturity models because they existed already. Question here, so you said that you based your input there on the system. I only got the, on the SLR, right, of how many additional models to define which are not discussed in this, in this SLR. The eight maturity, uh, that maturity model had about nine, I believe, uh, so, so that SLR. I found seven that were relevant to my study and uh, the table that that was there, I had to make it by myself because I wasn't in agreement with their table, what they were saying. I thought they had a lot of mistakes. So I had to, I, all I got from them was uh, a name of the maturity models. And one, uh, while, while I was discussing with my supervisor, uh, well, well uh, one, I could come up with one. So, and that one is actually dependent, uh, is, is based on one of the maturity models. So it's an improvement. They added, uh, they call a safe, scaled agile framework thing and they made it a new maturity model mm -hmm. uh, so that is the state so the recommendation what i would want to give you is this so you have quite a limited set of um, maturity models which you looked at and you have a limited set of uh, data what you collected right yes yeah. we have done some interviews within the structured way but it's still a limited amount of data so this is why you cannot generalize it from it yeah. but what you can do is you can use the method what we have used you can describe that method in a more handbook form way so that other people can use your assessment method to define what kind of maturity they need yep. right? uh, and that would be the actual contribution of your thesis yep. not 
these dependencies because the dependencies are specific for that case they are irrelevant it's just a test case mm -hmm. for your assessment method yeah so i hope that in thesis you have the assessment method as your major contribution well, uh, I, I didn't put it there, but uh, gladly, before uh, someone pointed out, I, I had some, uh, this is not uh, formal. So you have still a couple so, of so, so I have a, 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 an approach to make it more specific, uh, that model, mm -hmm. to make it more specific and uh, to add another uh, consideration. So, so yeah, because that's cause the I found of the thesis. It's not the assessment, but the yeah, methods, yeah, yeah. methods, how yep. to do the assessment. Yes. This is a use case. Yep. Um, if there are more questions, then we close it here and we have a longer break until the next program. Ah, well, I wish I could just go on talking. But that's fine. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much.